live streaming on Twitch or live streaming on YouTube? What is the difference? Hey, I'm John Santiago, and my guest on this episode of the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky shares her insights about the differences as well as the pros and cons between both platforms. And we also dive into her story. She has been a creator for almost more than a decade now online, and we dive deep into that and much more on this edition of the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky. Trisha Hirschberger is a creator, host, and producer known for her content in entertainment, gaming, and technology. She rose to prominence on the internet as part of one of the hosts of SourceFed, a platform founded by Philip DeFranco in 2012 as part of YouTube's $100 million original channel initiative. While at SourceFed, she was also a host for SourceFed Nerd and earned two Streamy Awards before leaving the channel in 2015. Independently, Trisha might be best known for The Naked Truth, her long-running vlog series on her personal YouTube channel. Since 2014, The Naked Truth has been her vehicle to discuss life-related topics such as bullying, love, motivation, and much more in a vulnerable and honest way. And after a six-year run on video, Trisha transitioned the show into podcast form at the beginning of this year. And it is my pleasure to welcome Trisha Hirschberger as a guest here on The Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky. Thank you so much for joining me today, Trisha. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. I think this is going to be a really fun chat. And uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. Yeah. I, you know, Trisha, I didn't get to tell you this as we were bantering before um, starting the, the the recording, but doing my research on you, I, I had to say I'm quite intimidated because there was so much that I feel like I could talk to you about I mean, I went down the rabbit hole of The Naked Truth and started, I, I watched some of the initial first episodes and I actually ended up binge listening through like the first nine episodes that you have out now on the podcast feed. And I was like, oh man, we're going to have, I, I'm excited to talk to her about this because I feel like there's a lot of uh, common ground that we have here in terms of just your views on self-development and and how that ties into your life as a creator. Um, but first and foremost, I do want to touch base and and start with where you where you came from. You come from a very small town um, in mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. T tell me if I'm saying this correctly. It it was um, Schwanksville, I believe. That's correct. You said it right. And the, I read that the the census, the 2010 census, is that the population of your hometown was around a thousand people. So I'm really curious about what That's it was totally like. Right. What what was that? What was that like growing up in a town with such a small population? You know, I think because that's where I grew up, that's still normal to me. Like, I don't think about. Schwanksville is like, oh, this really tiny town. I think that's just kind of what normal suburbia feels like. And um, larger cities, especially East Coast cities like Philadelphia and New York City and Boston are still very overwhelming for me in comparison, which is kind of why I settled in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a nice middle ground. It kind of feels like a very happening suburb because it's so spread out. You don't get that big, tall, kind of claustrophobic people on top of each other feeling that you get in some of those East Coast cities. Um, but yeah, I mean, growing up, I just, I lived in a small town where um, everyone, for the most part, uh, had standalone houses and large yards. So if you wanted to not walk to your neighbor's house, it was a pretty hefty haul to get to your neighbor's house. But, you know, I played with other neighborhood kids. And it, like I said, to me, that was like, normal. <laughs> gotcha. How do you think that, I mean, growing up and having that be like a normal environment for you, how do you think that kind of set you on this path to wanting to be in, in the arts? And, you know, I know that you're a classically trained actor. Um, do you think mm -hmm. that growing up in a town like that, where maybe like a lot of people kind of know each other might have helped you feel a little bit more um, comfortable with, with speaking up and, and, and being on stage? Maybe. I mean, uh, a career in the performing arts was not a thing that people really talked about or did in that area. 
so I was definitely the odd man out. The next town over had a community theater. And so I did some children's theater uh, as, as a little kid there. Um, because, I mean, my parents are not involved in the entertainment scene at all. So, you know, when their five-year-old said, I think I want to audition and be in shows, they were like, I don't know what to do with this. Um, you know, so I, I got to do community theater the one town over. And we found a kids' theater camp that I went to in summers. And I just knew that I wanted to perform and I wanted to entertain. And that's really what I enjoyed doing. So, you know, while it was something that was unknown for my parents and my parents were not, you know, in a place where they were capable to say, run me to Philadelphia or New York City for auditions, which is kids who really start as like a kid's entertainment career. That's what their parents are doing. Oftentimes, at least one of their parents doesn't work and their full time job is running their children to auditions, getting them meetings with agents, etc., so we were nowhere near that level. I mean, we were just kind of like, they were like, oh, you know, my kid wants to play around in theater. That's cute. Uh, and so if there was anything local that I was able to do, then that's what we did. But I mean, for me as a kid, it was just getting paid to play Let's Pretend, which most kids do anyway. You know, whether you're playing house with your baby dolls or um, you're acting out an action movie with your G.I. Joes, you know, whatever it is, you're essentially just kind of playing let's pretend and creating content in your mind. And I thought, wow, if someone's going to pay me to do that as a job, that's the job that I want. Yeah. And I remember you saying in one of, it might've been one of your old uh, Naked Truth vlogs about how your dad encouraged you to kind of think in this mentality of like um, spending, spend, spend time in your life doing the things that you actually enjoy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My dad is a very, very positive thinking, optimistic man. And he always said, you know, if you're going to spend 40 hours a week doing something, make sure it's something you enjoy. Like that is so much of your life. When you look at the percentage of your life that your work and career take up, try to find something that you enjoy. Now, granted, it's work and it's called work for a reason. So don't kind of have this um, over idealistic approach where you think you have to enjoy every second of it because I don't think any job fits that category realistically. Um, and now, especially with social media, having people only show the lovely parts of their job, I think now we're starting to see like the backlash of that line of thinking where people think, well, I don't enjoy it every moment. I'm just going to quit. And, you know, people are never really satisfied in that way. Um, but especially back then, before social media, before the Internet, um, having that idea of, you know, don't settle, find something you really enjoy was very positive. So. When you got into acting, can you tell me about one of your first roles? What do you and what you remember about that um, particular experience? So my first ever audition, um, it was a school play that like a theater troupe, a local theater troupe had come through my elementary school. I was probably in third or fourth grade. Um, and uh, they like did a little play for us and had a thing where the kids, there was like one role. It was an assembly. There was one role in each little 10 to 20 minute performance that they would cast one of the school children in. And um, they did these like little auditions and I yelled the loudest, which they said, we're looking for projection. We're looking for someone whose voice can command. And I was like, oh, I got this. So I was really loud. So they cast me in that little role. And then after that school assembly, they handed out flyers to all the kids um, saying, you know, we're a company that does do children's theater and we're holding auditions upcoming for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So I was like, oh, man, I'm going to audition be a dwarf because, you know, it was for like, I guess, grade school up through high school. So obviously the smaller children would be the dwarves in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Um, and I auditioned and they actually called my mom after the audition, which I don't know if they did this for all the kids because it's children's theater, but in the grit, in the real world you never get called when you don't get a part but anyway they called my mom and said we loved Trisha's audition but she's really just too small mm. and so my first ever real audition I didn't get because I was too small to play a dwarf wow that's <laughs> that's super ironic my god so like how how much bigger were the other kids um, I was, I'm, I'm still a very hobbit sized human in even in full grown <laughs> state. Um, but I think they, I think I was on the lowest age range of like, they were looking for kids from this age to this age. And I think I was on the very bottom of that. Plus I was super tiny for my age. Mm -hmm. So I guess I just, <laughs> it was too minuscule 
in the grand scheme of things. Um, but yeah, that was my first kind of experience with entertainment um, as, I guess, a career. It wasn't a paid job, but still, it was my first experience auditioning and, you know, trying to get the role outside of something that was school related. What did you learn most from that particular experience? I, don't know, I guess keep trying. I I feel like that's auditioning over and over and over and over, which if you want to have a more traditional career in the entertainment industry, your job is really auditioning. You'd like to say your job is acting, but most of the time your job is auditioning. Um, and then if you're lucky and do a good job at the job of auditioning, they let you come on set and play around for a little bit. Um, now, of course, there are actors who work very consistently and book all the time. And to those actors, I'm infinitely jealous. But for most working working performers, um, you're really auditioning more of your life than not. Um, and the constant rejection that comes with that just as a numbers game will either break you down over time and, uh, you know, make you reconsider whether or not that's really the career path you want or um, kind of embolden you. And at least as a kid, I was a very overconfident kid, even though I didn't have a lot of friends. I wasn't popular. Like me and my imaginary friends were taking on the world. Um, it didn't really bother me that I didn't get it. Like I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'll do the next one. How, I was so, just excited for the opportunity to try. So you would just were you were able to kind of have like a conversation with yourself that, hey, this isn't so much of a negative experience, that this is actually something that it's just part of the process and I have to go through it and then there will be other opportunities. Yep, exactly. Was there somebody who taught you that or you just learned that intuitively on your own? Um, I think I watched a lot of underdog protagonist films and uh, television shows. Um, so, you know, things like The Never Ending Story. Back in the day where it's like, you know, the, the person who you don't expect to save the world can save the world. They just have to keep trying and believe in themselves. I think that message rang true to me quite a lot as a kid. And again, in a very over idealistic, open, wide eyed, innocence kind of way. But it served me well at that time. And it's it's cool to see that it's still it's stuck with you throughout the rest of your life. Like I would imagine you would say that that's just like permanently ingrained in your personality at this point probably yeah <laughs> okay um i do i want to also ask you just about your interests um obviously you you know you you have these interests in technology um geeky type of interests in in nerd culture and whatnot um embracing these things that obviously like growing up you know from from listening to and watching some of your your past vlogs that that might have ostracized you from you know the other people in the, that you were growing up with it in school and whatnot um what what drew you down that path to be interested in kinds of in ki kinds of those things like was it just you know growing up you you just had an affinity for for action figures and and other stuff that that may be necessarily like younger girls might not be be interested in? Yeah, I don't know uh, what it was. It's not like I had an, an older sibling or something like that that was interested in this stuff. I was the oldest sibling in a house of two girls. Um, and I just really enjoyed watching the real Ghostbusters and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles much more so than like Care Bears or My Little Pony, which were the other shows that were on at that time. And uh, my mom tried to push me kind of into the more traditional uh, feminine th shows or shows. She always said shows that were not violent. Like she really liked Care Bears because they weren't violent at all. Um, but it's just that's that's not the entertainment that I was into. And then when the original NES hit the scene and I saw friends of mine start to get the Nintendo Entertainment System... Um, I was like, oh, man, I want that. Like, I was always into board games, but as essentially an only child, my sister's five years younger than me, so as essentially an only child for a while, convincing my parents to sit down and play Life or Monopoly with me was like a struggle. They weren't always available. So video games meant that I could still play games and I didn't need to coerce my parents into setting aside time to do it with me. So I was like, yes, that's what I need. Um, and my parents, you know, at the time, the Nintendo was very heavily marketed towards boys. My parents, it was very expensive. And they were like, I don't know about this. Um, 
But I kept asking and I, and I kept asking. And eventually, a family who had gotten a Nintendo entertainment system um, where uh, the one of the parents worked with my dad at his job was getting rid of uh, Commodore 64 mm. because they had now upgraded to the Nintendo. And so they were just getting rid of it. And my dad was like, oh, that's like video games, right? My daughter might like that. Uh, and so he brought it home for me. So even though that's, you know, kind of the gaming generation before me, really, that was the first video game system that I got to play on. Um, and it was very hard to find games and stuff for it at that point, especially for my parents who weren't so in the scene. So eventually um, they did, I, kind of as everyone else was upgrading to Super Nintendo, my parents uh, got me a Nintendo Entertainment System. And it was awesome. Uh, and uh, my life kind of was changed forever. And then when I got to the point where I was like, hey, can I get the Super Nintendo, please? They were like, no, you're so, you're so <laughs> done. Like, you, you play so much. We're nipping this in the bud. Um, but at that point, then, we had a computer, like a family computer for school or, you know, whatever else for my dad's work. And I very quickly taught myself to play the games I wanted to play on my computer and what I needed to do to the computer to get it to run my games. So I remember um, looking at my dad and saying, okay, this game Doom takes 4 MB of RAM. How do we get 4 MB of RAM? Because, I mean, I didn't know the internet yeah. to look it up wasn't really a thing. <laughs> and I was also probably like six or seven. I was very young. Um, and my dad didn't know that he's a mechanic. That's not what he does for a living. Um, but, uh, bless his soul. He helped me figure it out. And so from a very young age, I was, you know, very comfortable messing around with technology to achieve the end goal that I wanted to achieve. And all of these interests were completely separate from my, I want to be in theater. Um, so it was very, very strange. Then when I came out to LA, I got my theater degree back East. And then I came out to Los Angeles to pursue an on-camera career that I kind of tripped and fell into digital content and, I had never even thought about the fact that I could get paid to talk about my hobbies, like my interests. Like I was excited about tech. I was excited about gaming, but I didn't think that was anything that like related to a job that could pay you money. Um, it was just so far out of the realm of, you know, growing up in a small town. It's like, here's the jobs you can get. You go to school for these things and then you become this job, whether it's a doctor or a lawyer, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so I decided out of the jobs that I was aware existed, performing was the one that I wanted. Um, so then when I found out that like performing and all the other stuff I like to talk about could kind of merge into one career, that was a really cool moment. And um, that was really the beginning of this wild adventure for me. I imagine you're still in awe of that. Like, you know, we, just everything that you're able to do these days, right? Like the fact that you can play video games live stream it and there's value to that now right like this is something that didn't even exist to us when we were kids like well I think we're about the same age we're both you know you were, were we're relatively the same age here in like our 30s and whatnot and like I, that's the thing that I always think about when I look at like the gaming industry and the gaming space I'm like man all our parents and stuff told us stop playing video games you're wasting time what are you gonna do with that and now it's like Maybe you want to teach your kids how to play video games because they could potentially become an esports player. Um, they can build an audience through Twitch or YouTube and whatnot. It's crazy. Yeah, it's really, really cool. And valuing that community and valuing that style of entertainment is something that I think the previous generation is still learning. Um, but, you know, it's it's catching on and it's certainly a thing. And, you know, I've been able to make a living now for um almost the past decade doing this which is so cool and i value the community that i uh that i have online my friends really um so very much that if i go more than a few days without streaming like i i miss them i mi i miss i miss my friends um it's you know it really is a wonderful way to connect and especially right now in a time when so many of us feel isolated and not connected it's just it's been a brilliant and incredibly therapeutic thing um, for me and I hope for people who are able to watch that type of content as well. Um, you know, it's interesting. I started, as you mentioned, on SourceFed, uh, which was all pre-recorded content. 
which is still fun and it's still entertaining and great to make, but it is very different than the live content. Live content to me feels much more like theater, which is where I started out. So you kind of have that give and take and um, it's a much more communal thing. Uh, like I know back in the day, people would kind of um, turn their nose up a little bit at creators who called their community their friends. Um, and, you know, it certainly is more difficult, I would say, to have that type of connection through a comment section mm -hmm. um, with like pre-recorded content and then a comment section. But when it's when it's live, that... I, I don't know, that relationship just, it's its so much more of an ebb and a flow and there's something really lovely about it. And as a kid that grew up not having a lot of friends, it's cool to have a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really cool to hear you say that because like, it seems like, you know, I've, I, I saw some of your live streams and it seems like the way you approach it is just like, we're just hanging out. You know, we're like chilling here, like in my bar and maybe like having a couple cocktails and whatnot. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's very much like it, it's it's not like, you know, the traditional sense of or the tr traditional way of of broadcasting in television. Right. Where there's somebody like on the screen and everyone watches this person and listens to that person. And there's no interaction between the person on the screen and and the audience. But like the way that you do it is just very like chill, familiar, friendly vibes. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um it's quite lovely. Like I said, I really really enjoy it and um in the past, I would say 3 to 5 years, if not even more, I have um really pulled my focus off of YouTube and off of that more traditional pre-recorded type of content and put it more into other platforms um and specifically Twitch which is more live stream focused. So you mentioned the Dragon Rider Happy Hour which is live streamed. That's something live streamed on my YouTube that's brand new. Um but really my main platform for creating now is is Twitch. How, what was that like in terms of transitioning um some of your audience to other platforms? I mean, were there any particular things that you did or was it just kind of simply telling your audience, hey, I'm going to be hanging out here on Twitch, like follow me here and whoever comes, comes? I honestly don't know how much crossover there is. I'm sure there are some people and I have done exactly what you said where I said like, hey, I'm streaming over on Twitch now if you want to check it out. But there's a lot of people who don't have a Twitch account, don't want to join another platform for whatever reason, are more comfortable with the YouTube model of content, etc. Um, which is fine. Um, but I, I feel bad because I don't want those people to think I'm like leaving them behind, you yeah. know, um, just because I really do enjoy creating content on Twitch so much more. Um, and as someone who is kind of a, a multi hyphenate content creator in that I am not just, you know, a YouTuber where all of my income comes from YouTube or not just a Twitch streamer where all of my income comes from Twitch. I produce and write and host content for a variety of different outlets and brands. Um, and really kind of all of those things together make up my income um, and all my various uh, income revenue streams, if you will. So uh, it's funny to me when people, like as you said, kind of like Trisha's best known since SourceFed for the Naked Truth. I'm like, really? Because that's just kind of my personal diary. That's, that was never meant to be anything large at all. Um, most of what I have done have been like tech and gaming series for Lionsgate, for Legendary, for Comic-Con, for Fox. Um, so I always think of like my career kind of in terms of a lot of the tech and gaming content that I've produced over the years. Um, but and yeah, the, the Naked Truth is my baby side project and uh, Twitch where I live stream now. That's my happy time. That's my me time. So when I'm done my work for the day, that's when I stream on Twitch. And that's how I think of it, which is probably why it's a little more just kind of hanging out focused and very chill and laid back because that's what that time is for me. That's what that serves for me. Um, now, I could probably, would probably, I should say, I should, I would probably be better served to think of um, my Twitch and YouTube channels a little bit more like a business as far as growth and strategy and that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, like I said, my, my personal content creation on my personal channels, not channels I'm contracted with, um, are just, they're just kind of me time. They're, they're my fun, funsy, relaxing time. Trisha, do you find that there are differences between live streaming on YouTube 
relative to live streaming on Twitch? 100%. Yes, it's very different. Um, YouTube was later to implement moderation. Um, and YouTube kind of, at least when I first came up in YouTube, had this idea of like, you never want to ban anybody or moderate your chat, freedom of speech till the end of time. Um, and especially as a female, it made it very hard to be on the internet when you would constantly see um, emotional or sexual harassment in the comments. Um, and it does, it takes a toll on you um, and not be able to do anything about it. Now, that being said, at least at the time that I came over to Twitch, there were, um, moderation was already a thing. It's more culturally accepted and you can build out your community the same way you want to. Um, a good friend of mine once said that, you know, if you went to a coffee shop every day and the coffee was amazing, but everybody sitting inside the coffee shop was throwing food at each other and screaming at each other all the time, you probably wouldn't want to go back to that coffee shop no matter how great the coffee is. And if there's one down the store that has mediocre coffee, but everybody who hangs out in that coffee shop is lovely and wonderful, which coffee shop are you going to go to? Mm. And so, you know, that's really how I think about building out a community and um, having a community that kind of reflects the same values and, you know, kind of not morale, but, you know, just kind of the same. Like if I'm there to hang out and chill, I would love to have a community also be there to hang out and chill. Um, whereas on YouTube, it's a little more, I think because it was so pre-recorded video first, people assume that there's this wall where they can say whatever they want. And I don't know if they think about the content creator actually seeing it. People just tend to be a lot nastier on YouTube uh, for whatever reason that is. So if I'm going to choose like, hey, I'm done work for the day and all I want to do is play video games with some friends and I can choose a place where some of the friends might be really mean to me or I can choose a place where everybody's just happy to hang out. Where do you think I'm going to go? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just, I'm, I'm out of high school. I'm past the mean girls thing. I'm past the high school drama and I don't have the time or energy to deal with it anymore. So I'm, I'm going to go to a place that makes me happy. And I just think Twitch has done a much better job with that. Um, and you know, and again, that, that could be, I'm sure there are people who moderate wonderful communities and build out wonderful communities on their YouTube channels as well. But like I said, you know, kind of three to five years ago, I, I stepped more away from my YouTube and maybe if I had stayed there and kind of focused my energy on adjusting that community there, then that would be a different story. But for me, at least in my experience, Twitch has been a much um, more welcoming place to be. And I've heard that from other creators as well. It's interesting that the metaphor there that you have of like a, a coffee shop, right? It's like thinking about these online communities that you're building relative to like the physical realm, right? Like how would we actually interact with each other in person? Because sometimes I feel like with with what we do online, like you're talking about with YouTube, there there is this... We, we tend to forget like, wait, we're dealing with actual people here. <laughs> like there, there's another person on, on the other end here that is a human being that has feelings. And it seems like from what you're telling me that Twitch is kind of like baking that into its culture of how they're building out their platform. Yeah, I mean, that's how it's always seemed for me from the, you know, the moment that, uh, that I went over and joined Twitch, it was, you know, okay, and here's how, Here's how you can assign people moderator roles. And here's the privileges they have that go with that. And um, like I said, you know, I just, I went, uh, like one of the first big Twitch communities that I worked at that had a lovely community was Geek and Sundry. I went to work at Geek and Sundry where they were like, look, we have no problem with moderation. If anyone comes in here and is disrespectful to anyone on camera or anyone else in chat, I'm sorry, you'll be asked to leave. Much in the same way that if we invited you to a party at our house and you were disrespectful to the party hosts or anyone else at the party, we would ask you to leave because that's rude. <laughs> um, and it was the first time kind of coming from a more traditional YouTube background that I had ever heard that, um, you know, more that traditional YouTube background was, well, everyone's entitled to an opinion, even if it's an unpopular one. Mm. And I had worked for a couple different YouTube outlets by that point before I kind of went over and worked with Geek and Sundry. And so any kind of 
death threats, rape threats, like you name it, was just kind of allowed to stay in the comments. Um, And that's just something that you had to deal with as talent. So I learned very quickly, don't look at the comment section. And so I wasn't building a community. I just stayed out of the comment section. I would, you know, post my video and say, okay, good, it's gone live. And then not interact anymore because it was very, very soul squashing. Um, mm. And so, yeah, when I when I went to Twitch and I uh, and I went and started working with companies like Geek and Sundry that really valued moderation, um, it was a very, very eye opening experience. Trisha, I want to go back also in time here. I, I tend to jump all over the place in terms of like my questions of of, of where I want to go with with the interviewee, and I I do want to touch base on your time at SourceFed. Um, can you tell me about what the experience was like auditioning for that hosting role on that channel? So funny. That audition was so funny. So at the time, I was, I still wasn't really aware of the digital content scene. Um, you know, I was in LA auditioning for television and film and commercials. And really, my joking rule at the time was, if it's a job that pays and I get to keep all my clothes on, I will take it. Um, you know, like saying, even if they want to put me in a Barney suit and have me dance around, like, I don't care. You know, I'm not, I, I didn't have like this, like crazy prideful, I will only take certain roles, like whatever. If it paid and I got to keep my clothes on, I was happy to take the job. Um, I was waiting tables at the time for a long time out here while I was auditioning. And then right at about the time I got source fed, I had been working for Samsung's IT department as a marketing rep which was oh, a crazy wow. job that I just happened to stumble into because I liked tech. I just liked tech. And they were like, hey, we like how you talk about tech. Would you want to like talk about our tech? And so I started doing that job, which was very funny. Um, but yeah, I was kind of loving that job, but still just auditioning. And I went to an audition that was a random Saturday morning auditions, which usually um, more like non-union and kind of, you know, the the more up and coming grassroots kind of projects might hold auditions on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, whereas you're like very professional, your agent has to get you this audition. We're Monday through Friday business hours. So it was a Saturday morning audition that I submitted for myself. I just happened to find it online. Um, and it said untitled news show, hosting job. So I was like, oh, okay, rad. Um, didn't say what it was or anything like that. Just untitled news host. Um, and it said, you know, so then I got the email that like, Hey, you've been selected for an audition. Here's your time. Please come to this address. Um, and can you prepare three news stories? And I was like, you know, I didn't, I went to school for theater. I'm not a journalist or anything, <laughs> but they kind of gave us like five news articles or something to choose from. And it said, pick three and, you know, write them on index cards or whatever. So I picked three of them and I kind of scratched some stuff out on index cards and I went in and, um, did my index card news stories to camera. And then they started asking me questions. Like normally, you know, you kind of, there's either an interview and then you do your read or you do your read and then there's an interview. So I did my read. And then, um, and they seemed like, okay. You know, I was, it wasn't like, wow, we love you, which rarely happens. Most of the time they have poker face in, uh, in auditions. But I did my read and they, you know, seemed okay with it. And then they started asking me questions like, what kind of TV shows do you watch? And I was like, that's unusual for a news job. But sure, I'll play ball. Uh, what kind of books do you read? Do you ever play video games? What's your favorite video game? And I was like, this is the strangest interview for a news <laughs> job ever. Um, but they happen to be asking me questions about stuff that I genuinely liked and have liked my entire life anyway. So, you know, I, I didn't need to prepare the answers to those questions. I already had them. And then uh, at one point in there, too, they asked, uh, you know, do you know anything about technology? And I, you know, was out working my Samsung job that day. So I had a bag full of like tablets and phones ready to go. I was like, well, which of these do you want me to tell you about? And like fanned out a bunch of gadgets. Um, and again, so I think it was a very like right place at the right time when opportunity meets preparation kind of situation. Um, I was very ready for everything they were asking me and I had no idea. And so I left that audition and I thought, I don't know what that job actually was for, but I think I nailed it. 
Um, and so then either later that day or the next day, I got a call saying, hey, we'd like you to come in for a screen test. Um, and I came in for a screen test and I thought I would just be, you know, reading a host copy that writers had written because that's traditionally the way hosting jobs work. And instead I came in and they were like, did you bring a laptop? And I said, no. <laughs> uh, and so they were like, well, we'd like you to write a news story, a script for you and a co-host. And if we like it, uh, we, you know, we'll record it and see how it goes. And if we like it, maybe it'll go live on the internet. And I was like, what? Uh, so, you know, it was very much a like thrown into the deep end of the pool situation. And, you know, I, I picked a news story and I tried to write a funny script about it for me and another person who ended up being Elliot Morgan with me that day on my screen test. And we filmed it together and they, uh, they, they put it online. They liked it enough to put it online. And they said, you know, we're going to post this video. What's your Twitter handle? And I said, oh, I don't have one of those. I can barely keep up with my Facebook. <laughs> and they were like, great. We need you to make a Twitter handle right now. And so I said, okay. So again, just really being thrown in the deep end of the pool. Um, and so I made a Twitter handle and my video went live and, um, like a week or two later, they called me in and said, one of our hosts needs a day off. Can you come in as a fill in? And then that happened for a little bit until they said, um, Hey, we're looking to launch a second channel that's specifically nerd themed. And we'd like you to come on full time and start helping us develop content for it. So at that point, it kind of all clicked why they were asking me all those questions in my audition so many months ago about video games and books and tech and TV. I was like, oh, now I see. It didn't make much sense when I was thinking about SourceFed proper. But once I knew they were planning on launching SourceFed Nerd, it made a lot more sense. Because um, like I said, I didn't have any kind of degree in journalism or politics or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was really my entry point into digital content creation. It was the moment that I realized that this was a thing that you could do and produce yourself and it could, it could be a career. So then I had to make the decision of, do I leave my very stable Samsung marketing job <laughs> to do this very unstable content creation thing? Um, and I thought about it and I thought, you know what? I didn't move to Los Angeles to do marketing. I moved here to be an entertainer. So I know this is a huge risk, but I'm going to do it. And it's worked out well, I'm happy to say, <laughs> now almost a decade later. Um, but yeah, it was very scary at the time, for sure. Yeah, that's it's amazing that, that again, like that's kind of what was your launching pad onto this path that you're, that you're on now. Do you ever think about what would have happened um, had you not gotten that opportunity? Like, where do you think you would have been? Like, do you even think you would have ended up on this path of becoming a content creator? I don't know, um, to be honest. I, I Like I said, I feel like if it, it was a very um, when opportunity meets preparation kind of situation. Um, and I don't know what other opportunities would have come across my path in that time. I don't know if I would have been lucky enough to get, a, you know, like a hosting audition for G4 or something like that around that time. I generally at that time didn't really have the connections for something like that. Um, so it was, I mean, that job was most certainly a launching pad and it was most certainly a wonderful learning opportunity for me to learn about this other side, this digital content creation side. I probably just would have continued along the traditional um, entertainment path where, you know, you get, you get an agent, you hope your agent submits you for auditions, you go in your auditions, you do the best you possibly can and hope someone wants to give you a job. Now, I don't know which jobs may have happened for me after that and where those might have led me. But, um, you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe digital content, maybe not. How closely did you get to work with, with Philip on, on just the projects that you were working on with, with SourceFed? And what were some of the things that you took away from, from, from working with him? So we worked with Phil off and on throughout our time there. There were times when he was much more heavily um, invested in SourceFed and what SourceFed was doing and involved with SourceFed and time where he wasn't at all, where he was just focused on the PDS and SourceFed ran itself. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I was there full time for three years. Um, so I went through a bunch of different phases of how all, all the working dynamics and structure and what buildings we were in and all of that changed quite drastically. Um, but you know, what I will say is when Phil felt that there was something that needed to be tweaked or fine tuned with SourceFed, he would come in and kind of say, 
this is what needs to change. And we would all, we would all learn from that and try to incorporate that moving forward. And obviously YouTube has changed a lot since then too. And, and, you know, has changed a lot over even the course of the time that I was there. So just kind of learning to always adapt with it and kind of take a critical eye to your content and see what you're do what you could be doing better or maybe what you're doing that's not working is always super important. Um, he also, Phil also has a crazy work ethic. He was at the studio every morning at 6 a.m. So we had to be at the studio every morning at 6 a.m. And he held us to the same standards that he held himself to. So I think as far as, you know, a lot of people feeling like, like, I mean, that job we put out, five videos a day on SourceFed proper, three videos a day most days on Nerd, and then weekend content as well. So we were pumping out an astronomical amount of content at that time. And so, you know, we we all learned very fast what it is to be a workhorse in the industry. So in terms of all of that, it, what was what did the system kind of look like in, in regards to generating that, mu that massive amount of content on a, on a regular basis? Um, it changed a lot over the time. Um, there was no one set structure or anything like that. Um, it was always kind of adjusting to what the needs of the company were. And obviously, when I first started on, it was just SourceFed. Nerd wasn't a thing then. And then when we expanded to have Nerd be a part of it, and then eventually Phil expanded it to include other channels as well and other business endeavors as well. Um, but, you know, that was all run from a, a much higher up the food chain than me level. Awesome. Especially once everything got acquired by Discovery, and then we were part of Discovery Digital Networks. Gotcha, uh, Trisha. I also want to ask you too about your work with with different production companies and also brands. Um, you know what? What would you say? What what kind of advice would you give somebody who is trying to build relationships and and try to work their way into having some sort of working relationship with? with brands and, and companies to, to do production type of work with them? I mean, my advice is kind of the same no matter what career path you're on with that. Always be professional. Always respect everybody else who you're dealing with. Um, you know, treat everybody as you want to be treated. But you can imagine no matter what industry you're in, if you are taking a long time to get back to people, if you're not thoroughly reading their emails and addressing their concerns, et cetera, people aren't going to want to work with you very often. Um, because especially when you're dealing with a brand, they usually have a budget and they usually have certain results that they expect on a certain deadline. And so you have to, you know, turn the business part of your brain on and be a good working partner. If you're not a good working partner, people aren't going to continue to want to work with you. So yeah, what I would say to that is it means respect the people you're dealing with, um, respect deadlines and other people's time as much as possible. And um, what I've learned as I've kind of gotten very older, is, or <laughs> very older, as I've gotten older, <laughs> what I've learned is to be very upfront with your expectations. Um, you know, not every collaboration is a collaboration that's meant to be, and that's okay. You know, if it's something that you're like, this doesn't really make sense for me and my brand, and it doesn't really make sense for you as far as the return on investment you're going to get out of it, then it's better to just say like, hey, maybe we can work together on something that's a little bit more of a fit in the future than to like try to shoehorn it and it doesn't work out well. And, you know, just, just being very business minded about it and professional about it when you're dealing with other, you know, people in a, in a professional um, area. Yeah, it's like being able to, it sounds like to me, just being able to walk away from a deal if it doesn't make sense. And I know like a lot of people in whatever career field they're in, it's always like really hard to say no to things, especially when there are opportunities that on the surface might seem great for you. But, you know, really see, learning how to do that, I think, is a skill, right? For sure. Yeah, that's a skill. And I mean, I've been very lucky that Yes, I was pursuing a career as talent, but also kind of have a business side to my personality so that I could jump into those more producery type roles that so often are required of content creators, where you need to be the producer, you need to be the pre-production, you need to be the talent, you need to be the production behind the camera, you need to be lighting and audio and post-production and marketing and distribution. As a content creator, you're asked to do all of these. And I think it was interesting for me coming from a more traditional entertainment side of things 
expecting that there's a team of people that tackle all those different things and then getting thrust into content creation where it's like, oh no, but you do all of it. Mm. Um, so now I kind of have this career that I think I probably look at through a lens that's more traditional media um, or some type of hybrid between traditional media um, and making digital content, if that makes any sense. So I still prefer when I have the budget on a project to hire someone else to do my post-production. I still prefer to do that because there are people who are infinitely more talented at that than I am. I can do it if I have to, and I'm very grateful that I've learned those skills over the years. But if I can have someone who specializes in marketing do my marketing and someone who specializes in post do my post and someone who has a much more refined ear for audio than I do help out with the audio on a project, the final product I think will showcase all of those different people's artistic inputs and skill more so than if I had done it start to finish myself. Um, and that's a little bit more of that producer brain coming in. Um, and I think it also allows me when I am dealing with brands to kind of talk about it in those terms of, okay, well, are you looking for like, what budget level are you looking to do this at? And what are you hoping to get out of it? Because there's many, many different tiers for both. And we have to make sure we're on the same page before I want to enter into any kind of agreement or contract. What, what do you do or, or how do you go about um, evaluating people for jobs and opportunities to, to, take the, to take some of those things off of your hands? Like what, are, what qualities are you looking for in somebody, say, who, you know, that would handle marketing for like a production project that you're working on or, or uh, post-production? What, what are you looking for in some of those people? You know, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard to kind of find someone that aligns with your style, both your style and your work ethic. I have found, um, I've worked with people over time that are much in the same mindset as me when it comes to work ethic, but creatively not really, you know, where I need them to be or vice versa, creatively brilliant, but completely unable to make deadlines or deliver. So finding that combination is very tough. Um, and a lot of times I will ask people, um, who are people, who are other creators or other people who do what you do, whether it be marketing or post-production or whatever, whose work you really admire and tell me why you admire it. Because if they're able to verbalize, this is why I really like what this person's doing, that helps me a lot to see what they value creatively. Um, obviously looking at someone's past work, if they have past work to showcase is a great um, one for that as well. And then I think a lot of people when they hire, again, kind of across different industries, will say things like here, you know, when you submit your resume or cover letter, please do it in this format, which is like a very simple instruction that you would be amazed how many people don't follow. <laughs> and so if they can't follow that instruction, then you can be reasonably sure they're probably going, you know, not going to respond with the same detail when it comes to work they're actually doing. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of little tricks like that, but hiring is tough. Finding that match is tough. It's just like another skill you just got to keep working on and developing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've been very, very lucky to work with some amazing people over the years. Um, and, you know, so I know that people say in Hollywood, you know, it's a lot of nepotism and it's a lot of people hiring who they know and... Um, that is certainly the case. Um, but sometimes that's out of, I know I've worked with this person before. I know they can deliver and I know I like their style. So rather than having a, a whole new set of interviews every single time I have a job, I'm just going to go back and see if that person's available, which there's something to be said then too for consistency and doing a good job when you do work with someone so that they will come back to you for a rehire. Trisha, one of the last things I want to ask you here as we kind of wrap up this conversation is one of the things that obviously has has changed in your life um, over the last decade in terms of your your journey as a creator is starting a family, um, getting married and mm -hmm. having having a having your son. Um, I, I'm really curious mm -hmm. how motherhood has impacted your approach to content creation. If at all. Um, the only thing I would say it's really changed is it kind of forced me to took a, take a stronger look at work-life balance, right? So a lot of creators have a hard time finding that work-life balance because 
we do enjoy so much of what we do um, that it's very easy to work yourself into the ground or think, you know, well, the YouTube algorithm um, really likes channels that upload daily. So I have to do whatever I can, even if it's working, even if it's not sleeping, to crank out a video every day to please the algorithm or whatnot. Um, and this is why you so often hear creators talk about burnout because you are the product and you can only scale yourself so much before you're just done. Um, and for me, starting a family made me really look at that and say, now when I look at my list of priorities, right, my tiny human, he's the top. Everything else takes a backseat to him. So I don't, if I'm not, and and it's part of the reason, again, like I said, that I've kind of stepped away from YouTube in the last three to five years because my son's four now. And when looking at my priorities and looking what gives me the biggest return, um, and kind of makes me feel, and I don't just mean return as far as financial return, right? I mean, as far as what I, co- type of content I enjoy creating. Um, but also, sure, as a business decision, what gives me the best return? Um, YouTube really took a backseat. It was a, it was like a, no, thanks, I'm good. Um, because whereas, you know, before I had this list, little dude gets put in here and everything else gets moved down. Um, so something, something's got to give and you realize you can't do it all. And what's most important, you know, 50 years from now, when I look back at my life, is it going to be super important that I posted that trailer review that day? Or is it going to be more important that I sat down with my son and helped him learn his ABCs? And that just is what it is. That's well said. You know, I, I was browsing through your Instagram a little bit before we, we hopped on this conversation. And I saw like a post that you had with, with your son last year. And it was a post where he he asked you to play a video game with him. And I must have I mean, that must have been such like a cool experience to to have like this thing. Right. This this hobby of yours that has now grown into something that is also part of your business. But it's something that you can also share with your son, like th- this this passion that you have. Mm-hmm. I-, I imagine that is just something that, you know, being able to kill multiple birds with one stone, right? Like doing this for work, but then also <laughs> still getting to enjoy it with with your son is is something that is to be cherished. It's very cool. I'm excited for him to get a little bit older uh, so that he can kind of hang a little more, if you know what I mean. Right now, he's very just like, I have to say, Logan, press the button. Press the button, buddy. <laughs> uh, you know, he's not quite there on his own yet, but he just turned four. He's got plenty of time. Um, but yeah, being able to share that with him, I think will be super cool. And I hope that he, you know, doesn't enter into that kid phase where he's like, oh, man, everything my parents like is so stupid. You know, like, I'm like, no, please like video games, please. And so that that's my hope. But really, whatever he's into, I just want to support as much as I can. But yeah, the more I can share with him things I'm passionate about, the better. And that's super cool. And yeah, I mean, my son is not all over my Instagram. He's not all over my content. That's a conscious decision that I made when he was born um, for privacy reasons. Now, then, at you know, at first I made the decision of like never showing his face ever. Um, but then it felt really um, not genuine to be like, here's snapshots of my life and none of them include my baby. Like, I'm like, am I hiding that I'm a parent? I don't want to hide that I'm a parent either. Um, so he makes appearances every now and then, but it's, you know, it's a little more subdued. I definitely didn't want to go the route of making my content all about my family life because my husband and my son didn't sign up for that. That's not what they want to do. Plus, I really like talking about tech and video games, so I don't really want to change my brand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, so it's it's been a very interesting line to walk. And I um, actually s- organized a panel at TwitchCon. Last year, TwitchCon was in person about people who are parents who stream. And I had a bunch of different people on that panel talking about how you kind of balance that content creator streamer lifestyle and being a parent. And we had some people on the panel who were parents before they became content creators, some people who were content creators before they became parents. And what we really learned is that everybody has their own way of dealing with it. And there's a lot of different solutions out there and you just kind of have to find what's right for you. Um, But yeah, I mean, it definitely changed the way that I look at my content. It changed, you know, how I think about producing my content, et cetera. Um, from a privacy concern, from a branding concern, and just from a work-life balance concern. Well, Trisha, this has been awesome to connect with you here and chat with you on the Video Craft Show presented by 
Video Husky. Before we wrap up, obviously, let everybody know where they can find you, all the places on the internet that they can follow you online. Where can they do that? Um, so I guess the best place to go since I do, I, I'm very lucky to work for a variety of different outlets. So I don't have one that I can say, just go there and find all my stuff. The best thing to do is to follow me on social media, which is that girl Trish with no I in the girl. So that GRL Trish, and that is Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, and then YouTube and Twitch. It's just my name, YouTube or Twitch, uh, slash Trisha Hirschberger, um, And you can find my stuff there as well. And I try to playlist on my YouTube channel content that I do for other brands as well. I currently work as a freelance host for a variety of different tech and gaming outlets, um, some a little more frequently than others. And so, yeah, you can if you follow me on social, I'll tell you what I'm doing everywhere else. Um, And I also have a discord that is super, super fun um, that you can find if you go to my Twitch channel, you'll find the link for it there. But uh, yeah. That's where you can follow all the stuff I'm doing. And yeah, I mean, most of my content, as you said, is either um, either tech related, more in like kind of the PC building, PC modding world, light, light smartphone reviews, but I'm not the person that's going to review every single phone internationally released. I don't have that access. Um, so more like PC tech, um, gaming, lots of different gaming stuff. And uh, what I kind of like to refer to is fandom lifestyle, if you will. So like lifestyle stuff, but more with a kind of like geek chic fashion or sci-fi fantasy twist, um, collectibles, that kind of stuff that kind of all falls into what when I was a kid we used to call like geek and nerd stuff, but now it's pop culture. So I think fandom is maybe a better word for it. Um, But yeah, a lot of that stuff as well. And uh, like I've said kind of throughout this podcast, if you're listening, that, uh, you know, I, I treat my content that I make on my personal channels much more like um like a hangout like my just my personal me space we're just chilling and having a good time um and kind of the more uh professional highly produced stuff you will find um with the various brands that I partner with and clients that I work with so hopefully there's a little something for everybody definitely well thank you Trisha I really appreciate you for coming on the podcast thank you for having me Jonathan this was fun Thanks again to my guest, Trisha Hirschberger, for joining me on this episode of the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky. A few quick things, though, before all of you head out and exit this podcast. First of all, you can find the show notes in this episode and previous ones over at videocraftshow.com. And second, if you're a content creator that struggles to organize scripture ideas, We have made a resource for you. You can get a copy of our free script template. It can help you structure your videos and save you hours of time from filming in the process. To download it, just go to videocraftshow.com or if you're watching on YouTube, find the link in the description below and just subscribe to our email list. It'll get delivered straight to your inbox right after you sign up. And third, if you're enjoying the show, make sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We are always trying to make the show better for listeners and viewers like you. So any kind of feedback that you have for us, whether you are enjoying the show or if you just want to roast me because you feel like roasting me, it's totally fine. I I am totally cool with any kind of feedback, either kind of way. I'm always just trying to improve and Hearing from you is one of the ways that uh, we can improve the show. And finally, if you're watching the show on YouTube, just hit the like button, please. I ask you for that. Por favor. A little Spanish in there, throwing it in. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm and get the show in front of more creators just like you. You can leave us a comment, too, because we read all of them. I'm always paying attention whenever there are comments. You know, right now, this show is very young at this moment, so we don't get a lot of comments. So when you do leave a comment, we really do appreciate it, and I am paying attention. And lastly, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. Finally, got to give a special shout out. Thank you to the squad for helping produce this show. My producer, Nikki Vicente, Rex Estatislao, Shara Texon, Chaco Rukon, and Paolo Lopez, as well as the rest of the team over at Video Husky. If you want your videos edited to look just like this, then all you have to do is visit videohusky.com to learn more. I will see you next week on another edition of the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky.